So hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us in our continued discussions on the application of behavioral science in the UN system. My name is Mary McLennan. I'm the organizer of the UN Behavioral Science Group and I'm joined by my colleague Johanna here from the UN Innovation Network who's helped set up this webinar for us today. Um, I'd like to encourage you to turn your cameras on. What we're hoping to have today is more of a discussion. It's not a formal presentation, not a formal Q&A. Hopefully with cameras on we can get to put a face to the voice and really have, um, have more of a discussion amongst ourselves as well as our guests as possible. Um, so outside that, uh, the session, how we're going to run it is we will be collecting questions through the Slido. You can find the link to that in the chat. It was also shared in the invite to this, this meeting. Um, and there you can submit your questions as well as upvote those of your colleagues. Um, so if you don't have a question yourself, that's completely fine. Just please check it out and vote for others that you think um, you'd be interested in the answer to. Um, so if you have any questions with Slido, let us know in the chat. Johan will be in there and can answer them for you. Okay, so we only have, I think, about 45 minutes with our guest today. So we're gonna get straight to it, introduce him, and then get straight to the, the questions. So we have with us someone who needs little introduction to the group. Um, he, he's engaged with us before in various parts of the UN previously as well. So um, we have with us Professor Cass Sunstein. He's the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard University. He's also the director <laughs> and uh, founder of the Behavioral Economics and Public Policy um, work at Harvard Law School. He's a prolific academic writer. There's a lot I could say about that, but for the purposes of our discussion today, what I really wanted to highlight is that Cass is not only an academic, he's a practitioner, he's worked in this space. So um, this has included work from 20, 2009 to 2012 in the, uh, uh, the White House and the US government, where he was the administrator in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. He's also engaged previously with different international organizations, ranging from the World Bank to the European Commission to the WHO. So he's well-placed to be with us today and talk about behavioral science in the UN context. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to highlight that Cass is also a incredibly, an incredibly productive author. Um, you may know him from a number of his books. I won't list all of them here. Uh, but just one I wanted to highlight, which you've probably come across if you've engaged with behavioral science previously, um, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Um, I also want to say just within the next, this year alone, I, from what I can tell, I think Cass has about four books where he's authored or other co-authored. So I just wanted to bring up a few of those. Oh, there we go. How change happens. There's already a fan. Um, uh, so a few that I want to highlight just that are coming over the next number of months in case you're interested because they do relate to a number of the discussions we are having in the UN system. So the first, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Cass, I'm speaking about <laughs> things in the future, um, is an update on the book Nudge. So it was originally published over 10 years ago and thinking about the current state of behavioral science um, in practice and in policy, um, what do we know? It'd be really helpful to, to hear about that. I think there may actually be an interesting question in our Q&A today, to what extent have things changed over the last 10 years? There could be some, some things to pull out there. And I also want to highlight that Cass is writing a book on sludge, which if you've attended our webinar last November, you would have heard about the idea and what it means for the UN. We're currently exploring it in, in a project and, and thinking about it in broader discussions we're having. So those are just two things I want to highlight coming, coming in, in the near future if you're interested in this space. So I'll leave it there and um, say thank you for joining us, Cass, and um, get straight to our questions, if that's all right. Okay, so the first question in our Slido, and the Slido comes from Courtney Price at FAO. Courtney, would you like to ask the question directly to Cass? Sure, that'd be an honor. And thanks again for, for organizing this and this opportunity to all be together. Um, my question is one uh, intended to be slightly provocative, but most of all, taking advantage of your experience, not only in, in being a behavioral scientist, but promoting behavioral science. Uh, we seem to be at the cusp of something really big and all of us are believers, but we're preaching to the choir and sometimes who we're actually trying to engage with, uh, despite all our behavioral uh, expertise, isn't responding. So I'm wondering your insights into uh, nudging people to allow us to nudge or pr even just promoting and, and, you know, giving proof of concept to those decision makers we need to have on our side to make, to let us leverage behavioral science in the UN. Thanks. So, so thank you for that. And thank you for having me. So here, here's just a little story, which is that uh, you may have heard that the United States has a new president, uh, President Biden. And uh, there's a question, of course, about what role behavioral science will play in the Biden administration, having been very prominent in the Obama-Biden administration. And uh, I've, I've, these are my friends. I've worked with the president for years, I'm not gonna bother him. And also he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. And also 
people generally have the weight of the world on their shoulders. So some of us mentioned lightly to people over the summer that this was a potential avenue. And to my uh, surprise, I'll confess, uh, uh, in an early presidential memorandum, behavioral science was explicitly embraced and called out. And uh, President Biden uh, incorporated really executive order 13707, which is our behavioral science executive order, and said that our government has to build on it for guidance and recommendations within a relatively short period. Okay, that's quite a event. And even people who are close observers didn't necessarily expect that. Why did that happen? I, I don't know for sure, but I think I know, which is that there are concrete problems, the pandemic, climate change, racial justice, uh, hunger, uh, sex equality, to which um, uh, policymakers are clear behavioral science is relevant. So this wasn't a, an academic um, uh, fascination on the part of the White House. It's we have a tool here that can help us with our priority policies and let's see what we can do with it. Which is a long way of saying if a, an official thinks I have a problem and it might be you know, road safety or it might be premature mortality from something and this will help, then the eyes light up. To talk about behavioral science in the abstract, for some people the eyes will light up, but for a number they'll think, "What? What? That sounds kind of, uh, you know, researchy." And I, I got problems. Great, thanks for that, Cass. Would you like to respond, Courtney, with any with a follow-up question? Are you? I would just say thank you that uh, I hear you saying we need to put, uh, you know, pr practicality first, empathize with our audience and give them examples they can relate to. Um, I'm wondering um, why you think perhaps we're not, we're, we're still at the stage we are with regard to uh, not being there with behavioral science mainstreamed. Is that because we're not doing this enough? We're not making it practical enough? I think the progress has been almost beyond belief. So with, uh, Mary and Johanna's uh, leadership at the UN, look where things are now compared to 10 years ago. Uh, at the World Health Organization, uh, the DG is keenly interested in behavioral science and has a unit that is dedicated to this and is focusing on a number of things with behavioral science right in the spotlight. Uh, the most obvious of which is vaccine acceptance and uptake. In um, uh, the United Arab Emirates and in Qatar, there is focus on behavioral science as a way of addressing problems of health and poverty. With uh, Qatar, and I'm mentioning it because it might not have been first on people's list of behavioral uh, science users, but they really are. Uh, in connection with the World Cup and the health and exercise issues that the World Cup makes salient and an opportunity. Um, in uh, uh, Europe, we're seeing in Germany and in France and in uh, Italy and in Spain, uh, growing use. So it, this is young and the opportunities are massive, but uh, the the growth in a short period has been uh, beyond belief. Great, thank you for that, Kaz. Very helpful, I think, as we think about behavioral science in the UN context. Um, so the next question we have is from Alvaro from the UNDP. Would you like to ask your question? Great, thank you very much, Mary, Joanna, and Kaz for this session. Uh, my question is related to COVID-19 and vaccination. Uh, how can behavioral insights help in, in times of infodemic and, and misinformation, uh, in particular related to, to this issue, COVID-19 and, and vaccination? Thank you very much. Okay, it's a great question. Um, there are three standard reasons why people don't get vaccinated. And the star performer in terms of the one with charisma is misinformation. 
it's, it's connected with misinformation. But let's put a spotlight on the three. Uh, one involves a lack of convenience. If we see convenience as a large concept rather than a small one about um, uh, how expensive is it, how confusing is it, how humiliating is it, uh, how comp complicated is it. And the behavioral science suggests if you increase convenience, you will severely dent the challenge, even among people who might seem susceptible to misinformation. The second problem is complacency, where the idea is that there are a number of people who think uh, I can handle the flu. I've had that before, I'm 25 years old and the death rate is low. And uh, it's not necessary for me to bother to get vaccinated given things are gonna be fine. And there's a behavioral set of strategies for handling the problem of complacency. The third is what you're putting your spotlight on, which is um, confidence, uh, meaning a lack of confidence in the uh, vaccine, thinking that it's going to have terrible side effects, it doesn't work, it's a product of economic motives rather than public health motives. And there are strategies for dealing with that also, which involve uh, drawing attention either to professional health workers who tend generally to be trusted, who have been vaccinated themselves, who are, aren't just talking about it, but showing it. And also by showing that people who have the same kind of demographic characteristics or social identity as the people who are suspicious are actually themselves not suspicious. And they tend to be uh, helpful in motivating people to overcome their lack of confidence. Thank you very much, uh, Cass. Uh, I, I'm at the same session, we have also here a Lorena from Argentina that is also working on this issue. So I, I, I don't know, Lorena, if you want to ask uh, something more about this question. It was very uh, no. informative, Cass. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Alvaro, and also thank you. Uh, Professor Sustens, for your insight. We are currently working with misinformation, confidence, and vaccine access in, in, in Argentina, and hopefully we are going to partner also UNDP Uruguay uh, uh, with this regard. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm inspired by what you're all doing, so uh, really a standing ovation to you for this. Um, the World Health Organization's technical advisory group um, recently re released a port, report, it's short, called Behavioral Considerations on Vaccine Acceptance and Uptake. And it's, uh, the virtue of the report is that it isn't highly original. It's a summary of decades of research and it identifies what we know. And it also points to the need to learn in real time what's working. So in Argentina, I'm sure you're seeing on the ground uh, what is helpful and what is very challenging. And that will lead to you know, uh, better choices about how to help people and also lead to a research record that can be exported to other countries. Thanks for that, Kat. Oh, sorry. No, thanks for that, Cass, and thank you for the questions. Um, just because I think vaccination is a topic that's we're being addressed around the world, does anybody else have any comments they'd like to make when it comes to this topic, or is that please raise your hand in the chat function on Zoom, or or just unmute yourself and speak? Yeah, if you yeah I, I have a comment. Uh, we, we've been uh, <clears throat> trying to understand what other uh, sources of uh, barriers are there for. Uh, vaccination and actually the huge source of vaccination in case of Ukraine is the mistrust into the system. So there is mistrust to supply chain because it requires refrigerators. So it will be unfrozen at some point, like so many people believe in that. And second of all is there is a history of corrupt uh, supplies of, uh, of vaccines with bad quality. So it's a very rational fear of being mistreated again because the past time was not so far uh, behind. It was like, um, it was eight years ago when there was a huge uh, case of uh, vaccines of bad quality. <clears throat> so yeah, there is like this rational fear added to the common um, 
barriers in, in our case. The direction you're suggesting is perfect, where uh, there was a German psychologist in the 1930s who said, often when people aren't doing something, we think, how do we push them to do it? But he said, it's much better to think, why aren't they doing it already and address the barrier? And in Ukraine, evidently, there's an identifiable barrier. It might be very different from in Argentina. And to address that is a good idea. Thank you for that, Kath. I think it echoes some of the discussions we've had about behavioral science in general, thinking about the barriers and enablers to specific behaviors. So it really brings up some of the, the bits of methods we've started to explore in, in the UN space already. Um, any other comments or suggestions? Or questions when it comes to vaccination. If not, we can move on to the next question. No? Okay. Um, so next we have a question from Karen Esposito from UNODC. Would you like to ask your question to Cass? Yes, hi, thank you. It's an honor to be able to ask you a question and thank you to the organizers. Uh, just a question about leadership and potential for all UN personnel. How would you advise uh, that UN personnel who may not have positions of authority or leadership in the organization can develop that potential and put in place nudges or other projects that, that can improve um, working conditions, for example, but may not have uh, from the start that, that authority to, to run projects? Thank you for your ideas. Great, thank you for that. I'm thinking that some of the most um, effective responses to uh, the pandemic over the last year have been driven by people who aren't leaders, people who are um, working every day to try to help, and they have an idea which either they have implementing authority for because it doesn't require high-level sign-off, or because they just float an idea to leadership that solves a problem the leadership is self-evidently concerned with. Okay, one little thing that I noticed in my government, some people are very good at, is suggesting plausibly that an idea that is actually theirs is also the leader's idea. So to give credit to the leader, for the idea, if, it, if it's a credible point, either the leader has the goal or the leader has in some sense suggested the strategy, then to say, you know, consistent with your guidance, we might try this, or you suggested we should do this and here's a way of doing that. And uh, so to give ownership is often very good for, for Leaders, uh, I'm thinking you have so much more knowledge than I do about the background for this kind of question, but I have noticed at the UN that often there's dispersed creativity that's astounding. And there's sometimes clearance processes that are also challenging and people are so busy. But if there's, an idea that attaches itself very clearly to what leadership wants. In some of the sludge reduction all, all over the world with respect to economic and health barriers, Mary's term, uh, it's been, it hasn't been driven by leaders. It's come from people who say, we're gonna take this away. And either the leader says, good idea, or the leader says, I'm busy, go ahead. Great, thanks for that class. Would you like to respond, Karen, or? No, that's great, thank you. I think those are some, some insights that are helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that class. Okay, um, moving through our questions here. Uh, we have a, a more general one from an anonymous person. It's, um, what concepts from behavioral science do you think are most relevant or have the most value to the work of the UN? Uh, the clear prize winner is uh, increase, ease, and simplification. 
I think we're learning increasingly that if the goal is to achieve some end, to make it easier and simpler for people to get that is the best path forward. So here's a little data that's consistent with that. There's a technology which it's, it involves, uh, let's, let's just say it involves the internet, which if parents use it, they can track the progress of their kids and it has fantastic educational benefits. Uh, at a large school, the rate of usage was 1%, a great technology, it was 1%. The school district greatly simplified enrollment and the result was to increase usage to 8%. That's excellent to go from 1% to 8%, but it's not good, 92% <laughs> not using it. So it's excellent as, as an achievement, but it's not a satisfactory outcome. And then the school district changed the policy to uh, automatic, all parents are in it, they can opt out. And then parent, parental usage increased to over 95%, almost 100%. And I think that's almost like a little novel of the importance of making something easier and simpler. Uh, the second uh, choice next to that strategy would be to use social norms where either uh, explaining truthfully that most people are doing something or saying truthfully that most people are increasingly doing something generates a self-fulfilling prophecy. It increases usage. And it, you can think of the increasing ease and simplification, that's an architectural solution. And the social norm is an educational solution. Such data as we have suggests that architectural solutions have a larger impact significantly larger impact typically. And hope, I'm hoping that, that each of you with your work is thinking, how can we change architecture? Okay. No, there's, there's a lot in there, certainly. I think we've, we've spoken previously about the concept of a, a default and how we can maybe leverage that in the work that we do. Um, also, we've spoken previously about sludge and maybe some, there's some, some tones of this here in terms of how we make it simplified and easier for people to actually follow through with what they would like um, and for the person who raised um, how change happens social norms is, is a topic there so if you would like to explore social norms in the q and I think you can can expand upon that so thank you that that's helpful I think as a as a starting point for especially people who are exploring behavioral science um, I'll give one little example that might resonate and uh, President Biden and uh, thank you for your indulgence with my mentioning this uh, very significant change in our country issued just yesterday some executive orders that involved immigration and such and uh, one provision points to just what Mary's talking about and it shows that his team is on to behavioral findings about uh, Im immigrants often the processes are just really complicated and difficult. And for student visas, often, the challenge of getting one is insuperable. That might be by design in some cases, the goal is to make it really hard, but in many cases, it's not. It's just a, a insufficiently behaviorally informed architecture. And I'm thinking with respect to the SDGs and, uh, you know, the problems that for the UN are the very highest priority. This is in a way um, low hanging fruit for producing you know, very major benefits. Certainly, so that's helpful to, to illustrate with an example. And I think when we reflect upon our work, that's, that's something we can, we can start to think about as we go forward. Um, Okay, so next question is from Miko Nasino at UNDP. Would you like to ask Cass? Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Cass, uh, for the opportunity. So, uh, well, good evening from uh, Manila in the Philippines. Uh, my question is, um, while BE or BI has found its way in uh, getting institutionalized in most developed countries in the world since uh, in the, the, the administration in the US and BIT in the UK in the past 10 years, 
uh, I think it's safe to say that most developing countries' governments have yet to catch up on it. So uh, for those countries uh, whose governments have well little or no top-level buy-in on BI or BI adoption, um, how can we best accelerate BI adoption in our respective country assignments to be able to improve policy outcomes? Thank you. Great. Uh, it's a great question. Um, as you talk, I'm thinking that Rwanda uh, has been using behavioral insights and actually at the various highest levels, there's uh, sophistication. And that India very recently has created uh, a behavioral insights group, um, which is uh, addressing problems of poverty and development, also COVID-19. And so there are examples. I mean, one question is whether um, uh, it's possible to start small. So in Japan, which is a wealthy country, uh, a few years ago, there was just one person who thought we need to have behavioral science in our government. And uh, my understanding is he created something small, but it produced results and it's getting bigger. If there's a concrete problem that the person who's in position to do something, you know, like create a little unit or just give it a name and have a website in, you know, any developing country, that can fuel energy and it can get people who are, you know, aspiring to work in government or actually working in government or, gov or partners in the private sector to think that they have a, uh, uh, wind at their backs. So I wonder if the thought is if there's someone you know who's interested in this and you can make a suggestion, why don't we create a something? And it's not going to cost a lot of money. That, that's a start. And maybe if there's one problem to work on um, where there's likelihood that behavioral science will produce a result, I'm, uh, I'm conscious uh, that many nations, rich and poor, have too many deaths on the roads, and it's not a very, you know, politically inflamed problem, which is a good thing. But there are real people who are hurt, who need not be hurt, and that's just an example. I was in actually Argentina not long ago, and there was a lot of focus on road safety, and how could behavioral insights help? And there's a big book that our Department of Transportation has created, which is behaviorally informed. It's something like 450 pages. Um, and I can get it to you all. And no one reads this book. Even in my country, no one reads this book. But it's a, it's a gold mine. And you know, I'm thinking there, if smoking is a problem, or if alcoholism is a problem, then one can either use some ideas that are out there that are likely to work or a little more labor intensive do an experiment. What do you think, Miko? Well, uh, Cass, uh, what you just said uh, means a lot, especially, uh, especially what we're doing here in the Philippines. Uh, uh, since you've mentioned one, uh, that. Uh, creating that small group. Uh, actually, we're in the process of uh, working on such small group. Uh, uh, this is working with uh, even with our um, um, those we work with in the government from the inside, but they're they're on the, the mid level. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, what, what you just mentioned. Yeah, I, I think uh, I guess we're in the right direction, so to speak. But yeah, I, uh, we're uh, we're also interested. Actually, the, the the project I'm working on is on transportation. So I'll be really interested with uh, uh, the resource that you've mentioned earlier. Thank you. Great, thank you. Also, I'm uh, uh, especially delighted to talk to you because my dad was in the Philippines in World War II and he had, he's no longer around, but he had lifelong friends from the Philippines who visited us basically every year. So I feel, though I've never been, I feel in a way uh, it's, it's my country. 
Great. I think we may have made a connection, a useful connection here. Thanks for that, Cass and Nico. Um, and just a few other, to echo sort of Cass's sentiments here, I think you, as we've seen across the UN system, just some, some high level things that we're collecting in the report and other, um, having a project, having, showing proof of concept that this can work, this can deliver value, um, has shown to work in various examples already in the UN system and in governments around the world. So just want to echo what Cass said there and, and um, plus one that. Um, okay, so next uh, question. Um, so it's about sludge cast and we haven't mentioned sludge yet. So it'd be helpful if you can maybe define, explain what cast, what sludge is. So for those of you who, for those in the webinar who didn't attend um, in November. Uh, so how can we minimize sludge and oversight and audit functions without compromise? Okay, so um, sludge consists of paperwork, waiting time, clearance processes, administrative burdens, basically frictions that make it hard for people to get where they want to go. Sludge might be for someone who works in a government who's trying to implement a policy, who's facing administrative ba barriers and burdens. Sludge might be uh, someone trying to get health care who has to go through various processes to obtain it. Sludge might be a victim of domestic violence who's trying to get official help, who has to fill out multiple forms and be a witness under uh, embarrassing or humiliating circumstances in such a way as to make combating domestic violence a lot harder. Sludge might be uh, processes for getting vaccinated, which are arduous and confusing. Um, and the basic idea is that uh, international systems and governments often are trying to ensure program integrity. And that means you have requirements in place to ensure that people who get benefits are actually entitled to them or that uh, a decision is made properly rather than recklessly. And sludge might be part of the uh, the guarantee or the reduction of risk that you'll have recklessness. Okay, the, the, the basic suggestion is that many institutions have too much sludge. So uh, to my astonishment, I was speaking not long ago to uh, an official in the Trump administration that's not so astonishing, though I did work for President Obama. <laughs> We're all friends here. But what was astonishing is he only wanted to talk about one thing, which was this. He said in his department, they are so pervaded by clearance processes and administrative burdens that they can't work nearly as well and serve the public and the world in the way that they would like to. My wife has been nominated to be head of USAID and my expectation is she is going to encounter a lot of sludge. And that my expectation is, I'm not speaking for her, of course, but my expectation is, is that she will find that the sludge makes USAID uh, perform less well than it could. And the idea here is there's a liberation movement that we should all be engaged in, which is sludge reduction. In some cases, sludge is literally a violation of human rights. It is incompatible with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because there are some rights that it's very hard to enjoy because sludge makes it hard to enjoy them. It might be a right to whatever. In other cases, the ability to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals is undermined greatly by the fact that there's sludge in a process which some person without a lot of money is unable to, uh, the process is just unable to be navigated. And the suggestion is if we do sludge audits, and this is something Mary and I have talked a great deal about, and it's very much a work in progress, we can do informal sludge audits just in a course of two weeks, seeing in our own workplace, what's the sludge? or by seeing and dealing with, let's say, ordinary citizens who are trying to get access to something, what is the sludge? Or it could be more formalized and involve numbers where there's some effort to assess the volume. 
our Department of Health and Human Services did something like a sludge audit. Um, I had no participation in it. It was prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And they took a ton of sludge away. And they've discovered that so many requirements they imposed certainly made sense under a pandemic, but almost as certainly never made sense. So they've taken them away permanently. And uh, this is a frontier of applied behavioral science. It's just getting started. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that, Cass. It's like, obviously, it's very, very passionate about this topic, and it is something we are exploring. We are talking, we're, we'll be carrying out uh, informal sludge audits. Maybe, Johanna, if you can post in the chat, if anyone's interested in participating in our um, pilot sludge audit, um, please sign up and you can engage with us there. It would be, we'll give you more information if you're keen on that. Um, so, okay, so I, we're, I know we only have a few minutes left here, and I think it'd be uh, good to maybe get into more uh, specific in terms of topics. So, Maria Noel from UN Women in Latin America, would you like to ask your question to Cass? Are you there, Maria Noel? If not, I can... Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to listen to you, Professor. Um, my question is regarding how effective behavioral science can be used to fight violence against women, how we can really uh, start uh, advising governments, but also civil society, religious groups, um, what is the best uh, use of, of behavioral science? Thank you so much. What a great and large question. So if there's a uh as there is in all countries, violence against women, and that it's, let's say, not being reduced. Uh, first question is why? So what's, what's, the, what's the barrier to reduction? Is it that there's uh, a difficulty in getting access to the authorities to, to stop it or to put the perpetrators in jail or do something so that they don't continue to be perpetrators. So one question is, is that there's, uh, is it, it's really hard for a victim of domestic violence to get the authorities to help her. And that could be changed. Is it that there's a stigma about um, responding to domestic violence such that those who do have a much worse life? Now, something could be done to reduce the stigma or to make people who combat domestic violence or draw attention to it uh, feel proud, they're heroes, rather than you know, ashamed of themselves. Um, to signal to the perpetrators who are the main target that they are acting in violation of the law and the social norm. So that instead of feeling that that's what, this is what men do, feeling that this is something criminals do. And there are ways of having maybe uh, sp spokesmen who, who are credible, um, uh, you know, who have characteristics that are valued, who say, this is not what men do, this is what cowards do. And, you know, to engage in domestic violence is an act of cowardice. And, and that is, you know, the, the, so there are architectural things to make it easy for the victims to stop it. And then there are social norm interventions, which seem really important. Can I, tell, can I tell you something that it's not domestic violence quite, but it's really about sex equality. It's from Saudi Arabia, where men were asked privately, uh, do you, feel okay about your wife working outside of the home. This was in circumstances in which men could veto it or not. And the Saudi men, these are young Saudi men, they said, yeah, I think that's great. I'm completely in favor of that. Then they were asked, well, what do you think most young Saudi men think? And they said, no, I'm unusual. Most young Saudi men don't want their wives to work outside of the home. But the vast majority thought it was fine and good. So they were told, actually, what you think is what most people like you think. You're, that's the general view. And that was truthful. 
Okay, here's when things got interesting. Months later, in that population, there was a very large increase in the number of women who were applying for jobs outside of the home. So there to correct the norm. So it might be that in some countries, I hope it's the case, that the, the dominant view among men is that domestic violence is abhorrent, but that men don't know that, or at least some men don't know that. Would you like to respond, Marina? Well, I know social norms is a huge topic within you and women. Yeah, it it is what we do. I, I'm I'm happy to to hear you, Professor, because we are on the right track then, because we are doing exactly what you are saying. But um, and and maybe we have an enormous campaign that is called He for She, which is exactly that. What are you doing as a man to to, you know, for equality in general, but of course to to stop violence. What we are trying uh, to do, because you know, feminicides in Latin America. I'm, I'm the regional director of Young Women in Latin America, and feminicide is is progressive. It's, it's terrible. Last year, it grew 30 percent due to the pandemic as well. You know, it's related to the, you know, to the lockdowns and and to the lack of opportunities for women to to be outside their their houses, their homes. But um, you know. It's something that we need to crack it. And, and I don't think that this, of course, one solution, and it's mainly contextual, but also the legal framework and, and the attitudes, because nobody, no man is saying, yes, I'm violent and this is good. But, but the problem we have is access to justice and impunity. Uh, impunity is, in my view, the, the cause that doesn't trickle down to men to say, oh yes, I'm not going to do violence because I'm going to go to jail. So that is why it's so related. What, what, do, you, what do you suggest in terms of, of course, impunity, corruption is all what people know about my region, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, you know, how do we fight impunity with behavioral science as well? Thank yes. you. So, are, so I'm thinking that often when there's a very persistent problem, uh, a, a way into a solution is to find places where the problem has been at least partially solved. So, so what I wonder is, are there areas where there isn't impunity or are there areas where uh, murder rates have gone down and to figure out exactly why? With respect to impunity, the they, I'm not sure whether the levers are there, but the obvious thing is to have some cases which should be highly publicized in which men who have engaged in domestic violence have in fact been punished. And even if the rate of punishment, the percentage is, is much lower than it should be, if there are one or two cases where you can see a guy who's in jail, then men should notice that. So one way to put it is behavioral scientists point to the availability heuristic where we assess probabilities by thinking not of statistics, but of salient events. And that's usable to say, you know, for someone, you don't want to spend the next five years in jail. Stop hurting your wife. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that, Cass. I feel like that conversation could have gone on for, for much longer than the few minutes we have here. Um, but I do know it's, it's we're at the 45 minute mark, Cass. Do you need to leave? I also want to give you some scroll. Oh, I have something in a few minutes, but let's go another five or so if we can. Okay, sounds good. Um, Johanna, did you want to jump in now? We have a bit of a break to do and then we can maybe get a question after that. Sure, I'll give you a chance to look at the Q&A. Um, colleagues, I, it, it's so great to see so many of you here, and you know, most of your names from emails, as nice to see faces. I was wondering if you'd be willing to briefly come on video so we can take a quick photo or a video or something, um, a little piece of memorabilia to show how big this group has gotten, uh, especially when we have such famous uh, uh, speakers joining us. So uh, giving you a second here while Mary's looking at that. Um, I'll leave it up to you. Should we wave? Should we just smile? I can do either. Let's wave. For yes. example. So I'll turn this into a little uh, a little collage afterwards. Thank you so much. And handing back over to Mary. Great. Thanks, Johanna. And thank you all for participating in the 
in the photo. Um, okay, so the last question we have on Slido is from Claire. I'm not sure if that's Claire from the ILO. Would you like to ask a question to Cass? Sure, thanks. Um, I'm very happy we got so many questions, thank you. Um, I was wondering, I think a lot of us are trying to bring behavioral insights and behavioral science into our domains, and they're not necessarily domains in which behavioral science has been applied before. And given, I mean, there's a lot of research around different heuristics built up around different, you know, um, either types of heuristics or types of interventions. And I think that we end up in a situation where we have to do an experiment here to respond to a specific need and an experiment there to respond to another need. Um, but overall, a lot of us, I think, are actually wanting to build out a more strategic program of work so that we're actually building up on the knowledge um, in a way that it can become applicable to the domain as a whole. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice or tips on, on how to start thinking and building out that research agenda, if it's sort of starting with specific heuristics or interventions or, I don't know. Okay, I'm thinking that uh, for uh, the International Labor, Org Labor Organization, are there domains where behavior isn't um, producing the desired outcome? And it, it might involve, I'm just gonna say randomly, uh, worker safety, or it might involve well, worker well-being more broadly. And, and so it might be useful to start with identification of the high priority uh, challenges. That is, what, what is not going well for work? And then we can talk about what the interventions might look like with respect to those. So for worker safety, there are things that can be done, and, you know, reminders of, to, to not, not to do certain things which could create risks. Reminders are a very low cost often and sometimes very effective intervention. Or it could be that there should, could, should be warnings placed in various places. I'm thinking that you have in your mind like, 15 things that I know nothing about. So maybe to start with, maybe we can talk offline, but to start with a catalog of things that aren't as good as they should be. And then there can be mapping of those two solutions for improvements. Worker safety is an issue that I've, th I've uh, that I care a lot about. And that's one where uh, information and warnings are often helpful. But I bet, I bet this is all some, a boat that we're all building and we could do better. Mm -hmm. Just on that point, I think that the OECD, I, I did some work for them and, and on worker safety. So there might be some, a resource to check out, Claire, if you're interested in that topic. But is that helpful, Claire? Did you have a follow-up question for you? Yeah, no, that's definitely very helpful. And I think the, the, that's a really good place to start actually in terms of thinking about the priorities because the world of work is so huge. Um, you sometimes don't know where to start. And I'm sure a lot of other people on the call are facing similar feelings of being overwhelmed if not knowing where to start. So that's a good way to think about the prioritization. And I'd love to continue the conversation if, if that's uh, possible at some time, Mary, as well. You know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from your experience. Great, thanks for that, Claire. And I should, um, okay, so we're at the, I, we've had an additional five minutes, Kat. So I do realize I don't wanna take you from your next meeting. Um, so with that, thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate your time. As you can tell, we have lots of questions for you and this has been really meaningful for different parts of the UN, even just the short 45 minutes we've had. Um, so without going any further, I just want to say thank you so much again and um, hopefully we can engage going forward. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, yeah, be in touch soon. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.